In our final message of the conference, we focus on the Psalms and Christian preaching. We are excited to learn from Dr. Robert Smith, Jr., Charles T. Carter Baptist Chair of Divinity and Professor of Christian Preaching, Beeson Divinity School, Birmingham, Alabama. He is also an ordained Baptist minister, and he has taught in numerous universities, colleges, and seminaries around the world. Robert is the author of Doctrine That Dances, Bringing Doctrinal Preaching and Teaching to Life. He is also an editor of Our Sufficiency is of God, Essays on Preaching in Honor of Gardner G. Taylor, and a contributing editor for A Study of Christian Ministry in the African American Church, Preparing for Christian Ministry. In Robert's message, we will hear a sermon and be nourished by the Psalms, and we will also have a model of how to preach the Psalms as he expounds Psalms 42 and 43. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we hear the words of the psalmist. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? And then we remember who you are and our response is hope in God. For I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In and out of the depths, Psalm 42 and 43. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While those around me continually asked, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to lead the processions with loud shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. My soul is cast down as I remember you in the land of Jordan, on the heights of Mount Hermon and Mount Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the sound of your waterfalls. Your billows and your waves have overflowed me. You send out your steadfast love by day, and at night your song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. O oh God, you are my rock. Why have you forgotten me? And why must I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Like a mortal wound in my soul, those around me continually asked, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Take and rescue and deliver me, O God, against deceitful and wicked men. O God, you are my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? And why must I go on mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O send out your light and your truth. 
Let them lead me to your holy hill, to the place of your dwelling. Then will I go to the altar of God. Oh God, my exceeding joy. And I will praise you upon the harp. Oh God, my God. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God. For I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. Psalm 42 and 43 in and out of the depths. The authorship of this combined psalm is greatly conjectured and contested. Some think that it may have been a wandering Levite, one who would have escaped as an exile in the Babylonian captivity. And of course, with the temple having been torn down in 587 B.C., this wandering exile is unemployed. Some think that this may have been written by David. And others question it because of this statement found in the 43rd Psalm and the third verse. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to your holy hill, to the place of your dwelling. Uh, this is considered the temple, the place of your dwelling, which is no more. And of course, David did not build the temple. His son who succeeded him did. Others think that this may have been written by Hezekiah. 2 Kings chapter 19. With the Assyrian army surrounding the walls of Jerusalem. 185,000 soldiers were there that night. And Hezekiah had prayed and no doubt for those who said that Hezekiah probably write it, wrote it, that Hezekiah would have said by asking God the question and saying to himself and questioning himself, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? But when he woke up that morning, he discovered that God had sent an angel, a death angel, to kill 185,000 Syrian soldiers who were now around the wall, but they had been reduced to corpses. And upon seeing that, perhaps Hezekiah said, Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. Maybe Hezekiah wrote this after he had not only a national crisis, but a personal crisis. Second Kings chapter 20, Isaiah, the court preacher, had come to deliver to Hezekiah a message, Hezekiah being the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. And the Bible says that when Isaiah came in, he told Hezekiah that the Lord said, you are going to die and not live. Set your house in order. And maybe at that time, Hezekiah asked himself, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? But before, Hezekiah, before Isaiah could get out of the courtyard, God gave Isaiah a message to go back and tell Hezekiah that he's seen his tears and heard his prayers and he was renewing his life insurance policy and adding 15 more years to his life. And maybe Hezekiah's response in that 20th chapter, 2 Kings was, Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. Whether it was Hezekiah who wrote it, or a wandering exile from Babylon who wrote it, or David who wrote it, this is a psalm that echoes the ache of the absence of God and the longing for the nearness of God in the life of this psalmist. Uh, it's a psalm that expresses what Augustine in his confession uh, was trying to get across when he said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our souls are restless until they find rest in thee. This psalmist desires to dwell within the realm of the innermost recesses of the being of God. Because God has made us with a God-sized hole in each of us that nothing can feel except God. Money cannot feel it. Fame cannot feel it. Fortune cannot feel it. Relationships cannot feel it. Only God can feel this God-sized 
hole that is in us. I contend that Psalm 42 and 43 are really one psalm. Uh, that Psalm 43 is a sequel of Psalm 42. I contend that Psalm 42 and 43 go together. I say this because of the absence of a caption in Psalm 43. Psalm 42 has a caption. The psalm is a mascul of the sons of Korah. Mm. But 43 has no caption. I believe that this represents that both belong together. I believe that Psalm 42 and 43 are woven together because of this triadic refrain found in Psalm 42, verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 11, and Psalm 43, verse 5. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. That refrain runs through 42, 5, 42, 11, and 43, 5. This particular psalmist is represented by the sons of Korah, a masculine of the sons of Korah. Korah was a reprobate father, a reprobate individual. He is the cousin of Moses and was not in approval of God appointing Moses to the leadership of Israel. And therefore he organized a coup and brought 250 conspirators against the leadership of Moses. And we're told in Numbers chapter 26, verse number 10, that God had sent a fire to devour and consume the 250 conspirators. And God had opened up the earth to swallow up this Korah and others. So much so that we're told in Jude 11, Beware of the way of Korah. And yet, Numbers 26 and 11 reminds us that the line of Korah did not die out. Korah did, but not his descendants. And we see some of his sons, some of his descendants in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 19, when under the leadership of this great king, that the Ammonites, the Moabites, and uh, the Mayanites, that is the Edomites, got together in a trifold coalition against this great king of Judah. And the Bible says that the Korahites, uh, that is the descendants of Korah, sung a great song to the glory of God. They sung, let us sing to the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. Isn't it amazing that God would choose to use the descendants of a reprobate father? Even though the father was a reprobate, the children did not have to be. The genealogical association did not disqualify them for service. And therefore, God can use anyone, regardless of your roots, regardless of your color, regardless of your geographical connection, regardless of your genealogical relationship. God can use you. This psalmist, this community is a community that has experienced plunging into the depths. The depths. Do you hear it? Why would they uh, plunge into the depths? What had caused this plunge, this descent? May I offer to you some possibilities? Maybe they plunge into the depths of despair because of the absence of the temple of God, the absence of the temple of God. Hear the words in Psalm 43, verse 3. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to thy holy hill, to the place of your dwelling. Let them lead me to the temple, where the temple was. But the temple is no more, for in 587 B.C., the temple was pulverized by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. The absence of the temple of God. Perhaps we can detect the mood as we put our stethoscope on Psalm 137 verses 1 through 4 and we feel the weakening heartbeats of the exiles in Babylon. 
By the rivers of Babylon there we sat down, yea, we wept, when we remembered Zion. We hung our harps upon the willow trees in the midst thereof, for they are they that carried us away captive, required of us a song. And they who wasted us required of us mirth, that is, entertainment, saying, Sing for us one of the songs of Zion. And their response is, How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? We're in a strange land. There is no temple here. We are not participating in the three annual feasts of Pentecost, Passover, and Tabernacles. How will we sing the Lord's song in the absence of the temple? Perhaps we can connect with that feeling. We are living through a pandemic, and many of us have not been into the physical temple for months now. We miss hearing the preacher, the pastor, preach in the sanctuary. We miss hearing the choral selections in the sanctuary. We miss coming to the altar and having the intercessory prayer prayed by the minister in the sanctuary. Therefore, the absence of the temple of God may have caused some of us to plunge into the depths of despair. Why else might this psalmist community have plunged into the depths of despair? Perhaps not only just because of the absence of the temple of God, but maybe because of the apparent absence of the God of the temple. The apparent absence of the God of the temple. Hear the words from Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2. Verse 3, as well as verse number 10. Hear the words. The words come out so painfully penetrating. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants <laughs> my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night. While those around me continually ask, where is your God? Verse number 10 in verse in Psalm 42. This gives these words that touch our heart very deeply. Like a mortal wound in my soul. Those around me continually asked, Where is your God? This is what Jesus, of course, must have felt in terms of the absence of God. It was certainly what John the Baptist perhaps entertained in that 11th chapter of Matthew, verse 3, he's on death row. John the Baptist is the first cousin of Jesus. He has been the precursor of Jesus, the one who prepared the way for Jesus. He has been the promotional manager for Jesus. And now that he is at death's door, lying on death's row, waiting, awaiting execution, he sends an embassy to Jesus and asked Jesus, are you the Christ or should we look for another? And Jesus never made a visit to his first cousin, to the one who had said, Christ must increase, I must decrease. There's one coming after me whose shoes I'm not even worthy of unlatching. I baptize with water, but he baptized with the Holy Spirit in fire. And Christ was absent from the incarceration unit where John the Baptist was, and he had to die without a personal visit from his first cousin, Jesus. The absence, the apparent absence of God. You may feel that way sometimes. Not so much always that God is absent, but that God is inactive. He is not moving. Where is your God? In the times of your great struggle, the times of your great tribulation, the times when... It feels as if you have been left alone and you plunge into the depths of despair. Maybe, just maybe, this psalmic community plunged into the depths of despair because of their having a melancholy moment. A melancholy moment. Hear the words in verse 4 of Psalm 42. These things I remember as I remember the times when I led the procession with loud shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. Perhaps this, these are the words of that wandering exile who was employed by the temple, but of course, there is no temple now. 
He is unemployed. And what does a priest, a Levite do that's unemployed? Maybe Zacharias helps us to see the struggle. Zacharias, who was the father of John the Baptist and the husband of Elizabeth, he goes and takes care of his priestly duty. And while he's doing that in Luke chapter 1, an angel visits him and gives him the words that he and his wife in their old age, like Abraham and Sarah, will have a child. And Zacharias doesn't believe it. And the angel says to him, you will be speechless, dumb, until the day that John the Baptist is born and circumcised, which is the eighth day after birth. For nine months at least, Zacharias is unemployed. Because what do, does a priest do who can't speak? What does a preacher do who cannot speak? Do you hear the words in Psalm 42 and 4, how I used to lead to procession with loud shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival, how I used to. How do you handle life and ministry, whatever your ministry may be, when you have to use those words, I used to. Old age has caused you to say, I used to. Unemployment in terms of resigning willfully or being fired without justification. And you have to say, I used to. Some cataclysmic physiological event has taken place. A stroke, a heart attack, something that was debilitating and either limited your mobility or terminated your mobility. And you cannot speak or you speak uh, at a reduced level and you have to Say, I remember how I used to lead to processions with loud shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival, a melancholy moment, a moment of regret, a moment of nostalgia. I used to. Maybe the psalmist community has plunged into the depth of despair because of their conviction of the reality of the all causality of life. That is, the Jews believe that God was first cause for everything. Why? Because God is omnipotent. That is, God has all power. There is nothing that God cannot prevent. Therefore, if God does not prevent it, then it means God uh, permits it. And if God permits it, then God must have a purpose to promote it. And therefore, the psalmist cries out, in verse 7 of Psalm 42, deep calls under deep from the sound of your waterfalls, your billows, your ways have overflowed me. Do you hear that second person uh, pronoun? Deep calls under deep at the sound, the, the thundering sound of your waterfalls, God, your billows, oh God, and your ways are drowning me. Mm, they are yours. Because you didn't prevent it, you evidently permitted it, and therefore there must be a purpose in it. Certainly, Job could relate to that. Job was not around in chapter 1 for the prologue. He had no idea that God was talking to the devil behind Job's back. He had no idea uh, that he was going to be in the book of the Bible. And he certainly didn't know that the book of the Bible he was going to be in was named after him, the book of Job. And God talked in chapter one of the book of Job and God talked in chapter two of the book of Job. But from chapters three to chapter 37, God says absolutely nothing. God is divinely muted. It's a self-divine muting in position on himself. And he said nothing. And Job has to wait 35 straight chapters before God speaks in chapter 38 and answers Job from the whirlwind, and speaks in chapter 38, 39, 40, and 41. And finally in 42, verse 5, Job responds, I have heard of you, O God, with my ear, but now I see you face to face, and I did not know what I was talking about. Therefore, I repent in sackcloth in ashes. Maybe, just maybe, God has permitted something to happen in your life. You can't understand it. He didn't prevent it. 
He permitted it, and therefore he must have a purpose to promote from it. And we don't know what that will be. All we can do is take the advice of Søren Kierkegaard, the 19th century Danish theologian, who reminds us life must be lived forward, but it can only be understood backwards. Life must be lived forward, but you can only understand it backwards. And therefore, you'll have to wait. And perhaps you'll be able to say like Joseph says in Genesis 50 and 20, when his brothers have sold him into slavery, and he has had a phony molestation charge put on him by Mrs. Potiphar and has been forgotten by the butler and the baker. Perhaps we can say years later, what was meant unto me for evil, God meant it unto me for good in order to save many people alive. We sing in our churches, we are tossed and driven on this restless sea of time. Somber skies and howling tempests all succeed a bright sunshine. But in this land of perfect day, when the mists are rolled away, we'll understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when all the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story. How we've overcome, we will understand it better by and by. Perhaps, just perhaps, this psalmist community plunge into the depths of despair because of the apparent amnesia of God. The apparent amnesia of God. Psalm 42, verse 9, the psalmist says, Oh God, you're my rock. Why have you forgotten me? Forget me? Can the sovereign one get senility? Can the divine one get dementia? Can the almighty one get Alzheimer's? And yet one may feel forgotten sometimes. Like Joseph, like others, God does not forget. But it seems as if he does because he certainly appears to be inactive when we need him. And yet we say oftentimes in our churches, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time because God is not in time. Time is in God. And God never reacts to anything. God preacts before there's anything to act upon. God is the God who has the answer before we have the question. God is the God who has the cure before there is an illness. God is the God who has the solution before there is a problem. And therefore, Isaiah reminds us in Isaiah chapter 64, verse number uh, 25, or 65, verse 24, actually, where he says, before you call, God will answer. And while you're yet speaking, God will hear the possibility of the amnesia of God in their thinking. And maybe the psalmist community plunge into the depths of despair because it seemed to them that God was not acting according to covenantal conduct. That God was not acting according to covenantal conduct. God is not a God who reacts to anything. God is a God who is a God of purpose. And notice what the psalmist says in Psalm 43 verse 1. He says, O oh God, vindicate me. Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. And then he goes on to say in that very verse, O oh God, rescue me and deliver me from deceitful and wicked people. Notice, the psalmist is not trying to take uh, charge over getting back at those who had mistreated and offended him. He puts it in God's hand. These words are anticipating the words in Romans 12, 19, where Paul says that God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And God has made a covenant and you and I are his children. And when there is any kind of offense toward us, any kind of danger brought into the realm of our coexistence, our existence with God and others. God takes on those opponents, even to the place 
that he will cause us to come to the banquet table. He will prepare a table before us, not in the absence of our enemies, but in the presence of our enemies. God acts according to covenantal conduct, not in order for us to sick God on people, but rather because God has made a covenant with his people and that he will look upon us as the apple of his eye that we're engraving on his hand. And we need not try to take vengeance upon our enemies. God himself says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. But the psalmist does not stay in the pit of despair. He emerges from the depths of despair to the heights of delight, the heights of delight. Notice what he does. He does it by a kind of lyrical soliloquy, a lyrical soliloquy. For a soliloquy is a self-conversation where you're talking with yourself. He's chanting to himself. He's singing to himself. A lyrical soliloquy. That's found in those three refrains in Psalm 42, verse 5, Psalm 42, verse 11, and Psalm 43, verse 5. Listen to him talking to himself and singing to himself. Why are you cast down on my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. He is singing, chanting, and talking to himself. And he has good reason to do that because there is a precedent for doing it. God himself talks to himself. On that day of creation, God talked to himself. In Genesis 1, 26, God said to himself, let us make man in our own image. In the image of God made he them. Male and he made he him. Male and female made he them. God talked to himself because there's no one else to talk to. God talked to himself in Genesis 11, verse 7. And God said to those who were trying to build the Tower of Babel to go to heaven their own way, God said to himself, let us go down and confuse their language so that they don't understand themselves. And God talked to himself in the presence of Isaiah in the temple in Isaiah 6 and 8. He asked himself, whom shall I send and who will go for us? You and I, if we want to emerge from the depths of despair <clears throat> and rise to the heights of delight, must learn to talk to ourselves and tell ourselves what needs to be heard when we are surrounded and compassed about with so many enemies and difficulties. We are to talk to ourselves and ask ourselves the question, why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? If Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Talk to yourself and tell yourself what God has done in the past, that he has been faithful in your past, he'll be faithful in your present. Maybe the psalmist community that had plunged into the depth of despair is now emerging from the depths and rising to the heights of the light because of an unsinkable hope, an unsinkable hope. Listen to the last part of this triadic refrain of Psalm 42, 5, 42, 11, and 43, 5, where he says, hope thou in God. It's hope that Abraham has. Paul reminds us of those uh, in these words in Romans 4, 18, that against hope, Abraham believed in hope. He hoped against hope. Why did he hope against hope? Because God would say to him through the angel of the Lord, who I believe is the Lord himself before Bethlehem in the 18th chapter of Genesis. By this time next year, Abraham, you're 99, Sarah is 89. You're going to have a son. What? Mm. The Bible is taught that Sarah is beyond childbearing. That is, Sarah is postmenopausal. 
God had uttered this promise to Abraham nearly 25 years ago in the year of the Chaldees when Abraham was 75 years of age and God waits almost 25 years, a quarter of a century, to fulfill it. Waited until there was nothing left. Sarah was postmenopausal. Abraham was old. They had no way of producing a child. God waited until they were reproductively bankrupt. And then Sarah gets impregnated and has a son at 90 and Abraham is 100 because Abraham against all hope, medical hope, reproductive hope, believed God. You and I must come to the place where we have unsinkable hope that God will wait sometimes until we get down to our last dime, until we hear that report from the doctor. I can do nothing more to save you or some person that we love. Until it seemed like the career is gone. It seemed like the family is gone. And when we have nothing to offer ourselves to deliver ourselves, God steps in so that we will, against hope, hope because we believe in God. That great word from this, the great hymnist. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ. The solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. His hope, his covenant, his blood protect me in the swelling flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Maybe this psalmist emerges from the plunge into the depths of despair to the heights of that which is full of delight because of eschatological envisioning. Eschatological envisioning. Of course, by that I mean living as one looks toward the future, living in light of the future, living in the already as if the not yet has become the already, as if the future has become the present. Notice what the psalmist says in the last part of this triadic refrain. I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. Future, I shall again Praise thee, my Savior and my God. On October the 30th, we're nearing that anniversary now, the 10th anniversary, 2010. Our youngest son, Antonio Marie Smith, while working in his restaurant, the restaurant was, was uh, charged with a few teenagers who attempted to rob the store. Uh, they didn't get a dime. It was a failed attempt. And our son at the time was 34 years of age. Out of frustration, one young man stood on top of the counter and fired one shot into the heart of our son. Ten years ago, October the 30th, 2010. On his tombstone are the words of Psalm 42, 5, 42, 11, and 43, 5. I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. He waits for me and family of God who have been redeemed to join him in that celestial choir. For we shall again praise him, our Savior and our God. It is future. This, brothers and sisters, represents the story of the Christian life. Like an oscillating fan back and forth between despair and delight, up and down and so forth. This psalm begins with panting. As the deer pants like a deer is running from its predator. As the deer pants after the water brooks, so pants my soul after thee. My soul thirsts for the living God. For when shall I come to appear before God? But it ends with praising. Verse 5 of 42, verse 11 of 42, and verse 5 of 43. For I shall again praise thee, my Savior and my God. From panting to praising. That's where we go. I think that this psalmist, as a community, emerged from the depths of despair 
and was lifted up to the heights of delight because of grace. There it is in verse 8 of Psalm 42. You send out your steadfast love by day. Steadfast love, that's the word, Hebrew word, hesed, for our word, grace. He emerged not because of his self-efforts, but because he was propelled and lifted up on the wings of hesed, grace. You send your steadfast love by day. Mm, your grace. No wonder John Newton could say, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Twas grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us on. This psalmist rose from the depths of despair and was elevated to the heights of delight because of his ability to have a nighttime song. Verse 8, you not only send your steadfast love a day, but your song is with me during the night. I have a nighttime song. And those of us who have to face life and the harshness and the vicissitudes of life must learn to sing at night. The nightingale outdistances the singing of most birds because the nightingale has learned to sing at night. Sing these psalms at night when your soul is assailed. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Which does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Psalm 61, from the ends of the earth will I cry unto thee, O God. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. This psalmist community is able to emerge from the depths of despair to be elevated to the heights of delight because of the Spirit of God leading them. You say, well, there is no mention of the Spirit of God. It is true. And either of the two Psalms combined to make one. But we know the attributes of God. We know the characteristics of God. We know the traits of God, the Holy Spirit. And there in verse 3, the psalmist of Psalm 43 says, Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to your holy hill, to the place of your dwelling. That is a property of the Holy Spirit to lead. We see that in John 14 and 17. The spirit of truth. We see that in John 16. Verse 13, when the spirit of truth has come, he will lead and guide us in all truth. And the psalmist says, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead us to the holy hill, to the place of your dwelling. Uh, I believe that the psalmist arose from the depths of despair and was elevated to the heights of delights. Thanks be to God. Though it opens with panting, it closes with praise. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I want to retrace my steps and just very briefly tell you what my design was in treating this combined Psalm 42 and 43. I wanted to present a behavioral response to tribulation and trouble. That's why I said that the psalmist responded with a sense of lyrical soliloquy. He talked to himself about God. So I wanted my audience, my hearers, you, to see a behavioral response because psalms have to be preached with a behavioral response. How do we respond to what the psalmist or the psalmist community was going through? And then I wanted a sense of a sermonic eschatonic. That is, where, how is this text viewed in light of the future? And that's why I picked up the phrases that ended Psalm 42, 5, 42, 11, and 43, 5. I shall yet praise him, my Savior and my God to talk about 
even down here, life is not over. There will be a time when we will praise God and panting will be over. Sorrow will be over. Trouble will be over. Tears will be wiped away. And we will praise God forevermore. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we no less days of seeing God's praise than when we first begun. I wanted to present in this psalm the reality of the intertrinitarian presence of God, the intertrinitarian presence of God. I believe like Jonathan Edwards who said, God uh, has forever known himself in a sweet and holy society as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God has forever known himself in a sweet and holy society as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is, you can't trichotomize God at all. God never moves outside or without his Trinitarian presence. So we have no problem seeing God in the psalm. It opens up with God. When shall I come and appear before God? But then Christ is there as well. That's why I pointed out uh, in uh, verse number nine, where the psalmist says, O oh God, you are my rock. Why have you forgotten me? And I move to Psalm 43, verse 2. Oh God, you're my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? It reminds us of those words in Mark 15, 34, where Christ cries out, my God, my God, why have you rejected me? Why have you forsaken me? Those words were first on the lips of Isaiah in Isaiah 53 and 3 that says he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. I wanted to show the presence of Christ in the Psalms. The Psalms are quoted so many times in the, old, in the New Testament. So Christ is there in the Psalms. But then I wanted to show the presence of the Holy Spirit in the Psalms. Though not mentioned, God never moves outside of his triune nature there it is in verse 3 of Psalm 43 once again. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me to your holy hill and to the place of your dwelling. And then I wanted to talk about the entire psalm because a psalm has to be presented in its entirety. And that's why I combine Psalm 43, 42, and 43 together. And then finally... I wanted to create a sense of identification between the psalmist or the psalmist community and those of us in the 21st century who hear it, if you will, uh, some 3,000 uh, years later, perhaps, or if you date it as the Babylonian captivity is dated, 2,500 years. For you to see how you live uh, within the expression of the psalmist. It's James A. Sanders who reminds us that biblical characters do not primarily serve us as models for morality, models for morality, no, but mirrors for identity. How can I identify with the psalmist or the psalmist community? And therefore, all of these elements went into the preparation of this teaching in order that they might coalesce and find their reality by, by allowing us to be identified with that community. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord uh, make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forever. Amen. Amazing uh, sermon uh, message that uh, Dr. Smith brought to us today. It was uh, powerful. Uh, as I've pondered, I think what an encouragement to hear this masterful preacher preach Psalms 42 and 43. You know, like the previous message we heard on prayer, th this was, you know, the Psalms and Christian preaching. It was not only instructive to us, but it was also a model for us. So just my thoughts, Bill, here. What, what, what did you learn from this message? And what can we learn about preaching the Psalms from this message? Yeah, I, I, again, I think the Psalms are emotive. 
Uh, again, it's poetry, it, it arouses our emotion, and I, I think it needs to be preached that way, and I think it was modeled mm, so it well. Was. You could tell this psalm was deep in this man's heart. Yeah. Uh, and it came out so vividly in the end when words from this psalm were yeah. on the gravestone of, of his son. murdered son. Yeah. What a, what a deep, <laughs> penetrating expression of the meaning of this psalm in his own life. And, and, and in many ways, it's precisely what we've talked about regarding the psalms, why they resonate so much with our lives. And, and this, this truth is not the, the Psalm 42, 5, 11, 43, 5 was not just abstract truth. It was really truth that was lived in his life. Right. And I think as, as preachers, we have to take that to heart. We've, we've got to somehow experience vicariously the, these experiences of the Psalms before we preach and, and just pray that God would give us a heart to somehow express something of this. And again, faithful exposition of a Psalm is not simply telling how the psalmist felt, but somehow helping our listeners feel yeah. what the, the psalmist felt. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because that, that, that's precisely, a, a, maybe you can flesh it out a little further, but th what I was thinking, uh, one of the things to remember about preaching the psalms is that we are not just to tell our people the psalm, we are also to help them to feel the psalm, to internalize its truth and emotion. So I think I'm, we're agreeing with one another. So, so how is it that we might model that, we might foster that, we might nourish that? How, how might we do that? Well, I, I think that the psalm gives us imagery to uh, utilize as we try to do that. Uh, and, and we saw that modeled in this, in mm. this sermon. Mm -hmm. Some of the imagery, the, the panting yeah. of the deer, the, um, the, the, the sense of longing for what, is, what once was. And, so I, th I think those were all very helpful. Uh, it was interesting in the sermon how uh, Dr. Smith used biblical stories yeah, to illustrate quite, the quite Bible. Quite a few, right. Yes, the, the Bible just flows out of this thing. It was amazing. Yes, yes. You, you know, the two things, and we talked about this just a little bit, and that is, it, re it reminds me of some others, um, but, but they, they bleed Bible, and, and then when they're not bleeding Bible, the next breath they take is a hymn. Yes. And so it's, it's Bible-saturated, and then it's supported, illustrated, applied in, in a hymn. Yes. And, and in fact, our hymns reflect the Psalms yeah. in, in kind of using language to, to evoke emotion yeah. in us as it communicates truth. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say he used language beautifully. Beautifully. Yeah. To, to kind of communicate. Yeah. Um, so what... What can we, and I appreciate not only the message that he preached, but, but also then the, the, the summary of sort of describing for us what he did and, and, and why he did what he did. I found that to be helpful. Um, how much, um, you know, Phillips Brooks, a uh, number of years ago, lived in the 19th century, but, but he said, preaching is communication of truth through personality. Um, and, and I, I say that because I think h how many of us uh, would, would want, are able to replicate. I mean, uh, uh, our brother. Uh, I don't think I could say God the way he said God. <laughs> That's I, true. I couldn't do it. Um, I couldn't do it. But just the, the, the having memorized it. Yes. You know, oh, yes. and. He um, had internalized oh, that song deeply. It was, it was uh, and, and again, people have different gifts, and, and it was, and it was, it was challenging profound. and inspiring at the same time. It really yes. was, yeah. uh, I found, uh, uh, to be as well. Um, one of the things uh, that has been asked, and, and uh, over the course of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the messages, and that is, what recommendation do you have for preaching the Psalms, um, and, and, and especially a, a uh, preaching the Psalms as a Christian. I mean, that's been the focus uh, th through Christ, the fulfillment in Christ. Um, and how do you then, as one has said, you're in the Psalm and you make, as Spurgeon would say, a beeline for the cross. Uh, and how do you do that um, um, redemptive historically without getting there too fast uh, and being sensitive to the historical context in which God has revealed this Psalm? Well, I, I think you have to begin with the psalm in its context. Yeah. 
Uh, we don't know the exact context mm -hmm. of, of many of many the songs, of them, right. but we know they're in the context of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, the context often of, of King David, and I think that's where we begin. We, we seek to expound them on that level, but then broaden it out. Uh, I, I think the Psalms are meant to be applied to all kinds of circumstances because although the imagery is very specific, the reference are not. Yeah. Uh, so it allows them to be um, applied in all kinds of circumstances. Yeah. Um, and then I think, you know, thinking about the Psalms as Jesus' songbook, yeah. Jesus would have sung these songs. Uh, he sings them as the perfect man. He is the Psalm 1 man. He is, yeah. The blessed, blessed, blessed man. Mm -hmm. But because he's also the Lord, they are sung to him. Yeah. So there's both sides of that. Yeah. And, and thinking about both sides of that as we apply them to Jesus uh, and, and see them through the lens of Christ because he himself said they are fulfilled in, in me. him. Yeah. Uh, just as he said in John 8 that Moses spoke of him, we could say David spoke of him. Yeah. And, and I think seeing that, and, and again, not going too quickly there, but not neglecting no, to go exactly. there as well. So it's, it's avoiding either, either, I don't want to say extreme, but, but either bending one way or the other. Yeah, that would be that would be very uh, uh, good. Uh, any other thoughts or comments on this particular message? Because uh, I, uh, then we'll move towards a summarizing of. Yeah, of our I, time you know, I, th I think sometimes the, the psalms can be difficult to preach because they're poetry. Yeah. Uh, this one had a refrain, and so it you, did. Yeah. You, you don't necessarily go straight through mm -hmm. it. Sometimes you'll look at a psalm and you'll 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 pick out themes and you'll. You'll pick out certain verses. We saw this illustrated a little yes. bit with uh, uh, Walter's yes, message earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and, and even uh, uh, the other message about lament also yeah. did some of that. So, so there's an element of how do you preach that mm -hmm. uh, is a challenge. It's not this, you know, it's not a narrative. It's not a, an epistle that kind of you can work through very easily. So that that's a, that's a it takes some creativity to think how to preach it. Yeah. Um, you need to live in it to get the feel of it and the experience of it, the emotion of it. Yeah. Uh, you need to explore the imagery that is there. And, and we were talking to Greg Scharf about this. Yeah. And he finds the uh, InterVarsity Press uh, biblical dic Dictionary of Biblical, biblical imagery. imagery helpful. He yeah. said he, he goes to the index, the scripture index, and he finds it very helpful. He finds that they have discovered images that he didn't even realize were there. And uh, that dictionary he's found is a helpful tool, yeah. and I, I, yeah. I think that's a, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Um, explore those images, use those images. Um, and then, you know, I think we've seen in, in our preachers, they share something of their personal experience. Yeah. And I think that's helpful, yeah. that this is not abstract, this is personal, it has come through you as the preacher. And all three of our preachers who have expounded Psalms have given personal testimonies of how these words have impacted their life. Yeah. And I think that's helpful as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, there are, uh, there are, you know, you've, we've talked about both uh, joys and some of the challenges of, of preaching the Psalms, and there, and there are uh, uh, joys and uh, challenges. Um, uh, one more thing uh, with uh, Dr. Smith's message, and that is, you know, I appreciated his, his uh, emphasizing the panting. I think often uh, we read the Bible and we think that there's this serene, peaceful, you know, uh, uh, the deer eating grass, and yet that's not the picture of this, uh, of this uh, as a deer pants and as he, the predator uh, escaping. But, but the panting to praising, Talk about that just a little bit in light of, um, I mean, you could, it could really be a paradigm for, to some degree, the Christian life. It could be a paradigm for Christian living. It could be a paradigm for understanding the Psalms. It could be understanding the lament, um, the panting to praising. So just a, a thoughts about that. Well, I, again, I think the, the, the Psalms help to shape our emotions. Uh, the Psalms reflect our emotions but they're also meant to shape them. The, the Psalms are meant to take us from panting to praise. Yeah. That's where the Psalms end, yeah. and that's yeah. where we want to end. Yep. That's, that's where they, they're pointing us yeah. always. But in the realism of life, in this life you will have trouble, Jesus yeah. said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So uh, you know, I think that, that picture of panting to praise yeah. is part of the purpose of the yeah. Psalms 
in its entirety. Yeah. I, as I mentioned at the front end, uh, Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Well, it's been a wonderful. What a, what a rich resource yeah. the Psalms are to us. Yeah. And I think that's the message of this conference more than anything else. Yeah. How can we uh, allow this resource to, to flow into our lives, into our churches, become more a part of our worship, become more a part of our own devotional life, so that this wonderful song book, yeah. this, this prayer book becomes more a part of who we are as, as God's people worshiping Him. Yeah. And our focus was not, our focus was on the Psalms um, uh, and not, not in part of the whole Bible. And, and so uh, it's not all that we need to say, right? But it was what we needed to say with our focus on the Psalms in the canon of Scripture. It was, it was excellent. I mean, it, and, and uh, um, yeah, there's a lot to ponder uh, and reflect on. Well, let's transition. We're, we're moving uh, towards our conclusion here now. Uh, now, as we conclude the conference, a number of thank yous that I would like to share. Thank you to the Theology Conference team, Sylvia, Danny, and Lori. Uh, thank you to Michael uh, for planning and leading us in corporate worship, and also to uh, him and uh, the ministry team uh, for hosting us here at South Sub. And uh, thank you to uh, Bill, for joining me here uh, for Q&A. Thank you uh, to the communications team uh, who has had a key role uh, to make this happen. Nate, Natalie, uh, Josiah, Jason. And thank you to you for joining us. And mostly, thanks to the Lord who is our shepherd, our good shepherd. Now, we pray that you have been instructed, challenged, and nourished, that you've been strengthened personally, and that you have, had, you have been renewed to serve God's people where you are. There are many, many months remaining of this pandemic, and there are more challenges ahead. But remember the language of the Christian lament, and remember the recurring refrain from Psalms 42 and 43. Why? Are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation. Uh, these messages will be posted uh, in about a week on our Theology Podcast. The recording uh, of the whole messages, the whole conference, will happen uh, uh, immediately in a newsletter immediately after the conference that will have uh, some links and uh, the songs uh, of the Psalms and a number of other things. That will be uh, in your email box uh, shortly. Uh, next year's Theology Conference is scheduled for February 9 to 11. Uh, we are prayerful that we will be able to be in gathering in person. Um, with uncer some uncertainty ahead, we have not definitively determined a theme yet, but we are considering a few, and let me just share them. One is apologetics. That is, life and ministry in a postmodern and increasingly postmodern, uh, post-Christian culture. What does that mean? And there are just so many different things uh, that we could address in, in that. Another is ecclesiology, <laughs> the church. In light of uh, COVID and what it's revealed about the church and what the church looks like on the other side, uh, being mostly virtual for a year, what, what might that mean? Uh, another is discipleship. The issues of the day and the Christian's response or engagement with them reveals some flaws in our catechizing, it seems to me, of the saints and some idols that need to be destroyed or holiness. One of the marks of the Christian, a lack which keeps one from seeing God and yet has become optional. So these are just a few. Uh, please share with us your thoughts in the survey that will be forthcoming. And also to remem remember, the, there will be a question. Remember to share with us what the Lord has taught you and how he has encouraged you through our two days together in the Psalms. Finally, our book drawing, something we've been waiting for. We have uh, some books here. We've got three stacks of books, um, and we will send them to you. So here we've got uh, the names, the registered names. And Bill, I would like for you to grab one. All right, let's see. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Paul T. Henschel, Osco Community Church. All right, Pastor Paul. Yay! All right, Bill, number two. 
All right, number two. This is Pastor Timothy R. Lee, Harper Church, Port Orchard, Washington. Yay! And number three, and these are all books on, on the Psalms, and there are more than that's, that's on this table, but... And the third, Stephen Justice, Riverside Community Church, Columbia, South Carolina. Thank you for joining us, and we give thanks to God for uh, his presence with us and the things we've been able to learn from our time together and as we ongoingly reflect uh, on these things. Let me conclude with a, uh, a doxology from the Psalms, Psalm 72, verses 18 and 19. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen.